Welcome to Melrose Unitarian Universalist Church. Our service today is called Grace, the Gift That Keeps On Giving. I am the Reverend Dr. Suzanne Intrilligator, and it is my joy to be the minister of this congregation. Today's service, you may have guessed by the title, is all about grace, about how we each maybe need a little mercy in our lives right now, and how we can give that to one another. So, as usual, I ask for your patience and your help with our hybrid worship today. If you have any problems with audio or video, please speak up and let us know. As I say every week, our goal is not perfection, but connection with ourselves, with one another, and with the holy. Helping us create connection today are our two volunteers. Jim Duncan is our in-person usher, and Beth Yergrau is our chat host on Zoom. Thank you both for your help today. And thank you once again to Beth Cockerham, who led the effort last week to serve a meal on our front lawn. It was a gorgeous day, and the food was excellent, and I think something like 60 people came, and it gave us a real energy boost, so we're all very grateful. Thank you once again to Beth and all the people who cooked and all the people who came. I want to mention a couple other things about church this week. Um, folks here in the room, if you want to share a joy or a sorrow today in the service, please write them down on a piece of paper and hand them to Jim, your usher. Um, there's paper and pen in the Boyer, oh, and Jim is telling me he brought it into the room. So if you need to get some, or you can raise your hand and he can bring you paper and pen. Next week, we'll have a Zoom-only worship service when our remote guest preacher, C.B. Beale, is coming back. They will be exploring their heritage as a white New Englander descended from colonizers at the time of the holiday known as Thanksgiving. Speaking of that, now is a good time to acknowledge that our church sits on land belonging to the native Massachusetts people. To address that injustice, we ask people to follow the Massachusetts Indigenous Legislative Agenda, which is a group that lobbies for native justice at the state level. You can learn more about them by going to maindigenousagenda.org. Also, I want to mention next Sunday, if you still have a hankering for an in-person service, you're welcome to attend the Melrose Clergy Association's Interfaith Thanksgiving Service, which will happen at 5 p.m. at First Baptist Church on Main Street. As a member of the association, I had a hand in planning it, but I have that Sunday off, so I won't be there, but it will feature. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. And, <laughs> home too. and, and we can see you. <laughs> this is Yay. all terrific. Yay. <laughs> Our opening hymn this morning is God of Grace and God of Glory. This hymn was written in 1930 while the United States was in the throes of the Great Depression between the two world wars. Its writer, the Reverend Henry Emerson Fosdick, had just been named the minister of the new progressive ecumenical Riverside Church in Manhattan. He was a champion of the social gospel movement and a primary figure in the push against fundamentalism at that time. I love this hymn, and I love this hymn because it reminds us that for as long as people have existed, we have faced times that were just really hard. And for as long as people have existed, we have drawn upon our heritage and drawn upon a strength beyond our understanding to make it through and maybe even make the world a better place. Lyrics will be projected behind me, but is also number 115 in the gray hymnal. Please rise in body or in spirit to sing together. God of grace and God of glory, are thy people for thy power. How thy ancient church's story reveals what your glory is for. Grant us wisdom, grant us glory. 
Oh no. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humankind in fellowship to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. This is our great covenant, one with another and with our God. And now it's time for our story. Felix. Felix was putting one of the last blocks on his tower when his little sister came in. I want to build with you, she said. Felix scowled. Go away. You're too little. I'm big. Stay back, you'll knock it over. I can be very careful. Go play with your baby toys, Anna. Thwack. Grandpa! Grandpa shook his head. Felix, you just dipped from your sister's bucket. Like everyone else, Anna has an invisible bucket. When it's empty, she feels bad. But when it's full, she feels great. Didn't you ever notice your own bucket? Invisible bucket? Hmm. Sometimes Felix couldn't quite tell when his grandfather was joking. But the next morning, when Felix woke up, there it was. A small gray bucket floating above his head. When Felix came down to have breakfast, his mom was in a hurry. I've got a meeting this morning and it's almost time to go. Anna, sit still. Felix slipped and choco wheat scattered across the floor. Felix, yelled his mom. You should have used the stool to reach that. Felix could feel his bucket tip and big invisible drips spill out. Drip, drip. Ha ha, Anna laughed as she crunched the cereal with her shoe. Drip. Get the broom and clean that up before you miss the bus, scolded mom. With the school bus honking, Felix quickly swept up the choco wheats and grabbed the last blueberry muffin. But before he could even take one bite, Buster jumped up and grabbed the muffin from his hand. Drip. Hey, look at Felix's new backpack. My baby brother has one just like it. Drip. Psst, Felix, psst. Drip. Watch out, shrimp. Drip. It was still morning, and Felix's bucket felt almost empty. As he watched his classmates walk into the room, he secretly hoped they would trip and fall. That's what it feels like when you have an empty bucket. Felix slumped into a seat and waited for something else bad to happen. Mrs. Bumblenickel walked slowly up to his desk and handed him a paper. He could hardly bear to look. Felix, you wrote a wonderful story. Would you please share it with the class? Felix grinned and felt a big drop land right in his bucket. Drop! The class grew quiet. The Gigantosaurus who wanted a pet. By me, Felix. They laughed at all the right places and oohed at the scary parts. When Felix finally read the end, everyone clapped, even Emily, who sat next to him and didn't usually like dinosaurs. Felix felt a whole 
whole shower of drops land in his bucket. Drop, plop, clink, drop. Maybe the day wouldn't be so bad after all. So he got a note from his mom in his lunchbox. Drop. Team captains today are Veronica and Felix. Drop. Nice cow. It's a dog. Well, nice colors there, Felix. Cool laser ant backpack, Felix. By afternoon, Felix's bucket was nearly full. At recess, when he looked around, Felix suddenly realized that his grandpa was right. Everyone else had a bucket too. Let me help you. Drop, drop. Here's your baseball, catch. Thanks, dude. Drop, drop. Hi, I'm Felix, first day. Yes, I'm Amir. Drop, drop. The strange thing was that for every drop he helped put in someone else's bucket, he felt another drop in his own bucket. When Felix burst in the door after school, he shouted, you are right, Grandpa. I do have a bucket and I understand how it works. Then he saw Anna's torn doll. Bad dog, he almost scolded. But then he thought, dogs might have invisible buckets too. Your doll will be okay, Anna, said Felix. Mom will fix her. Until then, do you want to help me build the tallest building in the world with my blocks? And so they did. Thank you for that story. Each week we take time out for feedback. <laughs> but also, sometimes, we take time out for centering. That means we make a space here in worship for meditation and prayer, a time for each of us to connect with the holy. Let's start by relaxing into our chairs, feeling our feet on the floor, letting our bodies settle. Let's breathe in and out together. In this meditation time, first we'll join in our centering song, then we'll sit for a few minutes in shared silence. Then we will speak to one another of our joys and sorrows, and I will lead us in a prayer. Our worship theme for the month of November is holding history. So it makes sense for us to think about our ancestors in this time. The centering song is We Are. Our choir recorded this version last week, adding in images of their own ancestors. Please feel free to sing along. After the song, two minutes of silence. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are.
Jim, could you come forward, please? Every Sunday, we share with one another our joys and sorrows, the personal milestones of our lives. We witness, we listen, and we witness to one another with compassion and care, taking the time to grow into a stronger community. First, if you have a sorrow to share today, I invite those at home to type it into the chat box now, and I will read them aloud. Jim, do we have any sorrows from the people in the room? We do. This is from Florence C. A candle of, su of sorrow, support, and love as our dear friend Scott struggles with chemo. This is a sorrow for anyone who is stressed, anxious, depressed, that you may feel lighter. This is from Mary Beth G. A candle of remembrance for three generations of veterans who served in World War I, World War II, and Vietnam. This is a candle of concern for Mary. Richard's father, Michael Laura, took a bad fall and has been in and out of the hospital. And this is from the Zimmerman family. We feel sad after news this week that our precious dog Bentley has cancer. Thank you, Jim. Now I will read any sorrows on Zoom. I do not see any, but Beth, our chat host, am I missing some? Can you let me know? No, there are no sorrows. Thank you, Beth. All right, let's pause for a moment and hold all these sorrows that have been spoken, plus all those that are unspoken in our hearts and minds right now. Let us remember to reach out with care and compassion to all those who are hurting today and offer our help and our care. Jim will light one candle now as a beacon of care for all the sorrows that are spoken and unspoken today. And now I ask for all the joys that you would like to share. People on Zoom can go ahead and type them into the chat box and Jim can share the ones that are written on paper. No, okay, thank you. Let me go to the Zoom box. Do we have any, any joys on Zoom today? From Gretchen, our son Cameron and his girlfriend Emily are moving back to Massachusetts after four years in Portland, Maine. They will be living in Beverly. We're delighted to have them a little closer, though we'll all miss Portland too. Thanks, Gretchen. From Alex Leach, I'm taking the LSAT later today. Please pray for me. Don't know if that's a joy or a sorrow, but we will be praying for you, Alex. <laughs> any other joys today? I don't see any, so why don't you go ahead, Jim? Beth, are, am I missing any joys? Let me check in no, with Beth. No, you are not. All right. And Jim, as he does, does this, we'll think for a moment just to thank everybody for sharing their joys, which help to connect us and remind all of us of the beauty of living. We light one more candle now to shine out our thanks for all the blessings in our lives. Thank you, Jim. And now I have a prayer to offer. We'll figure that out. Hmm. Now I have a prayer to offer. Can you all hear me okay? Uh, there's a woman named Diana Butler Bass. She's a historian of religion and a columnist, formerly of the New York Times and the Washington Post. And she wrote this prayer for Thanksgiving a few years back. But I thought as we prepare again for the holiday this year, it seems even more fitting that we think about developing an intentional practice of gratitude. So I offer you this prayer. Please join me if you would in the spirit of prayer. God, there are days when we do not feel grateful. 
when we are anxious or angry, when we feel alone, when we do not understand what is happening in the world or with our neighbors, when the news is bleak or confusing, God, we struggle to feel grateful. But this Thanksgiving season, we choose gratitude. We choose to accept life as a gift from you and as a gift from the unfolding work of all creation. We choose to be grateful for the earth from which our food comes, for the water that gives life, and for the air that we breathe. We choose to thank our ancestors, those who came before us, grateful for their stories and struggles, and we receive their wisdom as a continuing gift for today. We choose to see our families and friends with new eyes, appreciating and accepting them for who they are. We are thankful for our homes, whether humble or grand. We are grateful for our neighbors, no matter how they voted, whatever our differences or how much we feel hurt or misunderstood. We choose to see the whole planet as our shared commons, the stage of the future of humankind and creation. This Thanksgiving, let us not give thanks, let us choose it. We will make this choice of thanks with courageous hearts, knowing that it is humbling to say thank you. Thus, with all those gathered at the table, we pledge to make thanks. We ask you, Spirit, to strengthen us in this resolve, here now and into the future, around our family table, around the table of creation, around the table of the earth. We choose thanks. Amen. Now is the time for our weekly offertory. Our church is a self-supporting organization funded by your generous annual pledge. You may also contribute to our weekly collection plate, which we split every month with a deserving cause. You can donate with the orange button at the top right corner of our homepage at melroseuu.org. Folks here in the room can leave their donations in the collection plate at the back on your way out. For November, our giving partner is Bread of Life, which feeds hungry people across our area. If you've been to a committee meeting with me, you might have noticed that sometimes, if there's any space left in the meeting, I might ask people for their sermon ideas what they think that people here need to hear on Sunday mornings. In the middle of last month, I did that, and one of our leaders asked me for a sermon on grace. And I think that she meant that in the sense of how we need to cut each other some slack these days. So I took that in and I gave it a ponder, and last week I asked some minister colleagues for their music ideas related to the theme of grace. And one of them suggested this 2017 song by the English pop musician, Jamie Lawson. I think it's great, and I think it gets exactly to what our friend was suggesting. Lawson says in the song, if you're coming undone, you won't be the only one. We all need a little mercy sometimes. Please enjoy the music. The speakers all face toward me, so when I'm sitting up here, I can't actually hear how things are going for you guys out there. It's a little weird. It looks like I can, but I don't really. So I'm wondering, if was that music too loud, or was it okay? It was okay. I got some thumbs up. Oh, thank you. All right, now on to our reading this morning. A chaplain in the German army during World War I, Paul Tillich, was hospitalized for combat trauma three times. He later became a professor at Harvard and at the University of Chicago. He is now considered among the foremost theologians of the 20th century. This reading is from his book, Shaking the Foundation. Paul Tillich writes, Grace strikes us when we are in great pain and restlessness. 
It strikes us when we walk through the dark valley of a meaningless and empty life. It strikes us when we feel that our separation is deeper than usual, when year after year, the longed for perfection of life does not appear, when the old compulsions reign within us, when despair destroys all joy and courage. Sometimes at that moment exactly, a wave of light breaks into our darkness, and it is as though a voice were saying, you are accepted. You are accepted, accepted by that which is greater than you, and the name of which you do not know. Do not ask for the name now. Perhaps you will find it later. Do not try to do anything now. Perhaps later you will do much. Do not seek for anything. Do not perform anything. Do not intend anything. Simply accept the fact that you are accepted. Here ends our reading. Have you noticed that people are a little bit more on edge these days? Got some laughs on that. I didn't expect that. <laughs> Maybe you have noticed that people are a bit more grumpy, maybe more combative. Some are more sensitive, more fragile, more self-conscious. Many are feeling difficult to please. Many are feeling unheard, unappreciated, angry. It is a very tender time, I think, in our lives, individually and together. Just a couple weeks ago, for example, there was a little furor here in Melrose about how best to celebrate Halloween. And then last week, another group popped up demanding transparency in the school board's decision about mascots. Strangely enough, the new group didn't reveal its members. Not very transparent. But those are just examples. Are people in your, old, in your own world extra pugnacious these days? So here's a story. The Reverend Kristen Grassel Schmidt is our minister in Silver Spring, Maryland. And last week on Facebook, she told her friends, among them me, this story. Officials at her alma mater, a seminary, were worried about supply chains and postal delays. So they decided to send out the school's Christmas cards early, like last week. And lo and behold, they received a bunch of complaints about it. Complaints. People actually wrote to the school complaining about getting a Christmas card too early. It's a little picayune, I think. Kristen herself was livid. She wrote on Facebook, I know an awful lot of people in an awful lot of businesses and organizations who are working so hard right now, giving so much time and energy and effort, and likewise finding that no good deed goes unpunished. No good deed goes unpunished. I have heard that saying around here in church more than a few times. I think it means that when people work hard on a project, even in church, they sometimes feel that what they get back isn't, doesn't feel to them exactly like gratitude. It feels sometimes like criticism. Even constructive criticism, when you are stressed out, can feel like an insult. And when you're stressed out, it can be much harder to give constructive feedback. We're not that good at it, even in the best of times. Sometimes helpful advice ends up coming out sounding like criticism, and it hurts people. And I think the problem underneath all of that is just perfectionism, holding ourselves and other people to some impossible standard. standard that, standards that, when you boil them all down, tend to equate human worthiness with productivity with how much we can accomplish in a day and how perfectly we can accomplish it. And is that what we really want? Is that in alignment with our values in any way when you think about it? Now, I myself fall into this trap just about every hour of every day. Last week, I was on the phone with a member of the church who was upset 
over what she experienced as a mistake. She missed a meeting, and she was sad about it, and she couldn't stop apologizing. And I kept saying, don't, don't worry about it. You already do so much for the church. But on reflection, what I should have said was, let it go. I know you've had a really rough week. Please just take a rest, have a bath, eat a good meal, take care of yourself. You are worthy. No matter if you're already doing enough for the church, no matter if you're not doing anything for the church, you're already worthy. Please take care of yourself. Of course, you know, a big part of this is the pandemic, the seemingly endless pandemic. But even before it started, we knew that as a culture, we were growing more polarized, more combative. But it somehow seemed further out there, less in here with us. Now, after two years of additional chronic stress under the pandemic, many of us are acting out more often or feeling targeted more often than ever. And I have a theory about this. I think it's a good one, but you can tell me what you think. I've been reading quite a lot in the last few months about cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. It's a highly effective form of treatment for anxiety and depression, and it's also a tool that anybody can use if they want to feel more grounded and more functional in their daily lives. Anyway, CBT teaches us to recognize what they call cognitive distortions. These are thought patterns that keep us stuck in negative spirals. Things like overgeneralization, for example, those people are always doing that. They'll never listen, overgeneralization. Or catastrophizing, which is, he's 10 minutes late and it's raining. I'm sure he's in a ditch somewhere. Or my favorite, which is all or nothing thinking, or black and white thinking sometimes it's called. For example, I am a total mess. I will never change, all or nothing. It's these kinds of thoughts, these cognitive distortions that can make anxiety and depression all the worse, as you can imagine. But for anybody, anybody under stress, more of us can develop these distortions or fall back into those kinds of thinking. So my theory is that because of the pandemic, the stress of it, more and more people are doing this. They're oversimplifying problems, accentuating the negative, picking sides, trying to see every issue as a battle between good and evil. So it wouldn't be surprising that now, as we're moving into the winter, our second, third pandemic winter, I can't even count anymore, the world would feel this way. In the language of this morning's story that Katie read, all of our buckets are empty almost all the time. Reverend Kristen wrote about the Christmas card complainers, listen, nothing is perfect or ideal right now. That's just the way of things in this season of the world and in our lives. It's not because anyone is doing anything wrong or malicious or because people aren't trying hard enough or they don't understand how it could be made better if only you saw things their way. Nobody has enough staff or time or bandwidth to do everything that's being demanded of them these days. Not doctors, not teachers, not restaurants, not church staff or volunteers, no one. The longer we expect things to happen the way they used to, the longer we will live with disappointment." Unquote. So I think all of this is why this member of the congregation asked me to preach about grace. Twice, actually, she asked me. I think I forgot the first time. So it was good that she brought it up again. Preach about grace. At first, I was totally flustered because the word grace can mean a lot of different things. In fact, the dictionary has nine different basic meanings. Everything from physical beauty to table prayer to God's saving actions toward humanity. But this member didn't mean any of those. It took me a couple of tries to hear her out. She meant the grace that we can sometimes extend to one another. Give each other a little breathing room. The moments that seem to get getting rarer in our world. So, so what is grace and how do we nurture it and bring it back into our lives? I like to start with etymologies because I'm a big nerd. So the word grace comes from the same root as gratitude, you may have guessed. The two concepts are interrelated, interwoven. Sometimes grace refers to the gift of life itself. And of course, people who can practice gratitude for life 
are often the same people who are most open to experiencing the movements of grace, both giving and receiving in a virtuous cycle. I think Paul Tillich has a great description too. God strikes us when we are in great pain and restlessness, he writes. When the longed for perfection of life does not appear, that's when grace can come to us. When grace breaks in like a wave of light, a voice saying, you are accepted. And curiously, Tillich doesn't say by whom you are accepted, just that which is greater than you. I might call that unconditional love with a capital L. Somehow Tillich says that many of us can affirm when we most need it sometimes that this voice will break through and tell us that we are loved, accepted whole as we are, no matter what. Not for what we can accomplish or become, not for what we have or who we are even, just as is, as broken as we are in this moment, we are loved already, all the way through. This is what grace means. It's the voice of love speaking directly to us. Now you can call that voice God if you want, but you don't have to. You can call it the universe, or our shared unconscious, or a memory, or even a wish. You don't have to explain it. Even Paul Tillich says you don't have to explain it. Just accept it. Accept that you are accepted. Know that you are loved. That knowledge coming at you in ways big and small, that voice speaking to you is grace. It's also, it's something that God can do, the universe, but it's also something that we can do. Which is why I chose today's story with help from Katie, because I think that bucket is such a great concrete metaphor for this. The story says we all have invisible buckets. That's what Grandpa says in the story, that every interaction, every single day, we can either fill up someone else's bucket, or we can drain it down. We can help someone feel better about themselves and their lives, or we can make them feel worse. And the really cool thing, as the kid in the story learns, is that it's not a zero-sum game. If, if I fill up your bucket, it doesn't drain away mine. Or if I tear you down, it doesn't build me up. Life doesn't work that way even if that's what our culture sometimes wants us to think. It's just not true. When I build you up, I fill up my bucket too. Helping you helps me. Criticizing you, even constructively, doesn't actually make me look smarter most of the time. We lose sight so often of the fact that we are worthy no matter what. We are worthy from the moment we are born until the moment we die, worthy now and in every single minute of our lives. But our culture wants us to forget that, to deny it, to judge ourselves and others for what we can produce or contribute or create. And we have to admit that's a capitalist model. It's a value that's tied to a system that monetizes time and monetizes people. And it encourages us to work every minute of the day and to strive for perfection all the damn time. And it's wrong. It's not human. It's not loving. And it's not moral. In our call to worship this morning, I shared a poem by Emily de Tarbert called Necessary Mercies. I believe in naps, she writes. A glass of cold water, long showers, daydreaming while everyone else meditates. Those are necessary mercies. She's reminding us to live in our bodies and to let ourselves rest and relax, probably more often than we even know we need to. She goes on. We were made for grace, not for perfection or productivity, but for wet cloth on fevered temples, for layered cakes, for the person who holds the door and pays for our groceries, grace is the only way we all get out alive. So many great images. Wet cloth on fevered temples. 
so tactile, so embodied. She's saying we were made for kindness, for simple human caring for one another. Layered cake, meaning that we were made for joy, simple joy, like birthday parties and family gatherings. And what else in the poem? A thank you for the person who holds the door and pays for our groceries sometimes. These are the people who are acting out grace in our world, people in their gratitude for the gift of life who see simple, fragile humanity and worth in others, even total strangers, and decide to give them a break in the moment. Not just a break from perfection and working and striving all the time, but a break from having to prove ourselves and our worth all the time. We are already worthy all the time. The poem says grace is the only way we all get out alive. What does the poet mean by that? I think she means in this time of huge global problems, climate change and income inequality, that individualism is finally dying. The dog eat dog, everybody for himself ethos of consumption and growth forever is played out. If we want to survive, if we want to solve these problems, it has to be all of us together. The us versus them just isn't going to get us there. We have to start with what we hold in common, gratitude for life, shared acceptance of our flawed and imperfect and already worthy nonetheless human selves, start with connection and move toward love. We were made for grace, not for perfection or productivity, but for wet cloth on fevered temples. Today, I wish for all of you wet cloth on fevered temples. I wish you a glass of cold water, a long shower, and a nap. I wish you all the rest that you need so the next time that you are out and about, you have the strength to be the one who holds the door, who pays for someone else's groceries, who fills someone else's bucket. Today, Grace says, you are already perfect, already worthy, already loved all the way through. There is nothing you need to prove. We are all hurting now, every one of us in need of grace all of us in need of one another. And we already have all the love we need right here and right now. So may it be, and amen. And now Tara has what I think is the perfect closing hymn. <laughs> there I am. We close today with May I Be Filled with Loving Kindness, number 1031 in your teal hymnal. Words will be behind me once again. The words of this hymn are from the Buddhist tradition of prayer and meditation. When we engage with these words, we extend grace first to ourselves and then outward beyond ourselves. Please join me in our final hymn.
Please, if you would remain standing, thank you so much, and join me in our chalice extinguishing words uh, now on the screen. We extinguish the flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Amen. Please be seated. Our service has ended. Folks here in the sanctuary can have a short prelude in a minute from Tara. People on Zoom can go into our breakout rooms as they like. I'm going to end with a vote in good UU fashion. We couldn't decide if we wanted to have conversation hour today. No coffee, remember. Uh, if we wanted to have conversation hour on the front lawn or in parish hall. So who would like to have it on the front lawn? We can take off our masks on the front lawn. Who would like to? Oh, there's more hands going up. One more time. Front lawn. OK, parish hall. Dan, I'm sorry, you lose. <laughs> all right, so please, after the prelude, join us on the front lawn, go all the way out, and we can talk out there. Thank you, thank you all for worshiping with us today. See you soon. Mm -hmm.